Hello and welcome to the second episode of IRTV Now, a show where we unpick the latest trends affecting IR professionals around the world. For this episode, we will be discussing all things regulation, looking at the launch of the ISSB standards, the UK FCA listing rules reform proposal, and the first piece of regulation for artificial intelligence, the EU AI Act. But coming up first, we hear from Noemi De Stefano about the latest developments for the ISSB and what this means for corporates. The ISSB standards are finally here. Launched in London at the IFRS Foundation Conference on June 26, after more than 18 months in development, IFRS S1 and S2 hope to bring a new era of sustainability-related disclosures in capital markets worldwide. The ISSB said the drop marks the crossing of a frontier for the investment community. We were standing till this morning on one side of that frontier. And we crossed it. We crossed it this morning with the launch of S1 and S2, our general requirement and our first climate standards. And I'm super happy to share that with you all here the IFRS Foundation's uh, global community. It is here in the heart of the City of London that today the International Sustainability Standards Board has launched its first two global sustainability reporting standards, IFRS S1 and S2. The standards, the speaker said, will set a new language for companies to communicate risks and opportunities, a language that investors can understand and will facilitate informed allocation of capital. The chair of the ISSB, Emmanuel Faber, defined the launch as a game-changing moment for markets. We've engaged regularly with IOSCO, with the Financial Stability Board, and that's why I would dare to say today that we confidently uh, wait for the result of the uh, very thorough and due process that IOSCO is starting now that we've published our standards on the endorsement of the standards as they would be another game uh, changing moment um, in the ability of uh, markets to benefit from the work that we have started here. At the conference, IR Magazine spoke with Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the ISSB, and asked why should companies adopt these standards? Companies should use and adopt the ISSB standards because this is a really targeted way to focus on the things that investors really need to understand about sustainability risks, but also sustainability opportunities. So it's a really targeted and focused way to, for a company to tell its story. How am I managing sustainability risks? Why should you put your money with me? Because I'm really planning carefully to ensure that I have a sustainable business that will last the long term and to really emphasize where there's opportunities to attract capital as well for investment opportunities and so that's the whole basis of our um, exercise it's efficient and effective reporting for companies to communicate with investors and so it's really a great value proposition both for companies reporting but for investors consuming the information I think that's really what sets our standards apart it may well be a new great value proposition, but it is also an area of concern for some companies. At the latest IR magazine Think Tank Europe, held a few days before the ICSB standards launch, we asked delegates how ready did they feel for the drop of the two standards. Might be surprising for some, but 69% of attendees said they did not feel ready, while only 31% felt confident ahead of the launch. We asked the ISSB Vice Chair what she thought of these results. We know that this is a really big change in reporting for many companies and so our standards have really been set up to be realistic about what we ask for companies um, in terms of timelines and the types of information they're being asked for. But the first thing I'd say is that many companies are on the way to being ready, maybe less, uh, more prepared than what they expect. So if companies have used the TCFD recommendations, we know many have, they've used the SASB standards, CDSB framework for example, our standards build on those and so that means they've got a 
really good foundation for this type of reporting. So that's the first thing I'd emphasize. But it is still a big change and I understand that. So what we've done in our standard is a, a few really important things for companies. The first is making sure that when it comes to the reporting, we are introducing things in a measured way. So in the first year you use our standards, we don't require reporting on risks beyond climate. That can start from the second year. And when it gets to climate reporting, some of the disclosures, notably the scope three information, isn't required in the first year. And that's to enable more time for companies to get ready, really acknowledging that we know that there's quite a journey for companies. But even when you get to the details of the standards, we've really tried to be proportionate as well. We know that we're not going to have the perfect information on things like scope three, certainly not right from day one. We know people aren't going to have every piece of data that they might not, they might need. We know they're going to need to use estimation. And our standards are set up to really support that. At the think tank, we also spoke to ESG experts and IROs and asked them to share some advice on how companies can prepare. When it comes to reporting against these requirements, um, my advice would be not to use this as a tick box exercise, but use it as a as a lever for um, for supporting kind of internal engagement and draw, you know the change that that is coming behind these frameworks. Um, obviously, these are something to report against but these are going to be things we report against every year. So the progress point is really something that's important. So not just about being compliant, tick, that's done. It's about what does it mean and how do we drive the change uh, that we need to across the business. I've got quite a few of our um, clients, um, heads of IRs, who don't feel as comfortable with some of the ESG pieces as their sustainability team would be. But they need to be. They need to be able to understand it because they need to be able to articulate it to the market as well. They need to be able to understand how the market is going to view them as well. So I would say that 100% they need to get comfortable with it. And if they don't feel comfortable and if it feels like it's a little bit over their head, they either need to be syncing with their internal teams a little bit more or utilizing some of the, the partners that they already have. Brokers can be really good. They have ESG teams that might be able to, to talk them through it as well. They might have providers that can help them as well that, that do it. We speak to a lot of our clients about ESG and about what it means to them. And we have people that partner with us to be able to, to do it. So I think you need to be able to understand who you can rely on. If you don't have the time to do it for yourself, try and be able to reach out to others because unfortunately it is really important and you do need to be able to prepare yourself. In a conversation with the head of global ESG research at the Bank of America, we also discussed how this new set of standards would impact companies in the long term. So, a, a lot of the investors have been asking the ESG questions corporates for the last few years, so this is not something new. What is probably going to be institutionalized in a way with these disclosure requirements, start getting into the habit as a corporate, to disclose this environmental information to start with for the regulator, for ISSB or for your investor. And the second thing to remember is that keeping the European Union in mind, there's going to be a shift and this kind of information will have to be in a way audited. So we are moving towards a situation where you will have a standardized ESG disclosure requirements this ESG information will be certified by auditors. This will firstly happen in Europe. And of course, other regions will follow, not because of the regulatory pressure, because investors will be getting this information for some of the European companies. So they would ask the same question, a global company with operation in Europe, or a company that might be domiciled in Asia or Latin America or US with no exposure to Europe, but investors will want to benchmark that company with a European peer. The newly launched IFRS S1 and S2 will be effective from January 2024. Businesses that choose the voluntary adoption of the framework would start collecting sustainability disclosure information for the 2024 reporting cycle and publish reports in 2025. In tech news, the European Parliament approved on the 15th of June the text for what is set to become the first piece of regulation for artificial intelligence. IR Magazine investigates this new piece of legislation. The EU AI Act will look to impose a tiered and risk-based approach to regulation. As part of the digital strategy, 
the EU wants to regulate AI to ensure better conditions for the development and use of this innovative technology. Depending on which risk category the AI system falls into, the regulation would permit its unrestricted use, permit it with some obligations, permit it only if the systems are subject to compliance with AI requirements, or simply prohibit it. Vote is closed and it is adopted. Congratulations. Dragos Tudorake, a member of the European Parliament, explains the reasons for needing to regulate AI across Europe. I decided not to regulate the technology itself. I think this would have been wrong, but to look at the uses of technology. And then uh, our attempt was to categorize those uses that would bring about risks to the values or to the interests that we want to protect. And we have created categories of risk. On top of these categories are those uses of AI that are so harmful, that are so detrimental to the interests and to the values that protect that we simply do not want them on our market. IR Magazine recently attended the NIRI Annual Conference 2023. We asked attendees what they thought about the new rush of AI, the need for regulation, and how this new technology can benefit the IR community. Up first, we spoke to Nimesh Devi, President of Notified, who shared his thoughts on implementing AI. I think, you know, AI can be used for multiple purposes. I think that, you know, it's very early in the governance cycle, so it's hard to say what will happen with it. I think you do need to use AI responsibly, but you need to think about AI in two different strands. You have to think about AI as public artificial intelligence, using engines that are in the public domain, and then private AI. So let's take a separation around two topics we talked about today, which was ChatGPT, right? Should you, as an investor relations officer, load your release into ChatGPT? The answer is no. Once you've done that, you've basically contributed to the public domain. But on the other side, if you're running your AI engine on OpenAI on Microsoft Azure or AWS, you can load into that engine. That's still going to be your data. It's still going to but it's going to give you an outcome and it's going to tell you, is that a good release? Is it a bad release? Those are things that we've already started doing at Augmenting Inside Notified. We released our own set of patents now on press release distribution. How do you write a press release using augmented information and artificial intelligence? We also spoke to Daryl Heaps, CEO of Q4, who described AI as an assistant and unpicked the benefits this new technology can offer when engaging with investors. If you look at the kind of the what you would use in a, an assistant, if you have an assistant and you have the ability to be, have a larger team that has an assistant, a lot of the requests to to those assistants would be um, or to administrators is really around kind of the some tactical elements in terms of like uncovering, looking at data, looking at ownership tables, being able to understand kind of what changes in my in my shareholder base. But the really powerful things when you think about an IRO using a AI powered assistant is having things like um, show me who are the investors that uh, that I. Have. I'm not spending that time with. So who am I spending all my interactions with? Who should who should I be spending more time with? And being able to connect AI to not only kind of like open data, which would be kind of like general data that's on the internet, but the really powerful part is when you add proprietary data on top of that, which would be like unique analytics, unique data sets, but then the, the really powerful part is your own personal data. So if you think about kind of three layers of data, that is when it really becomes powerful because then you're not just getting generic answers, you're getting answers that are useful for you and your program and how you can be able to spend the right time, the right amount of time with the right investors. I think that's really where it's very powerful. So it's, it's kind of got broad applications in terms of the analysis and prioritization. Um, and then ultimately helping to just give you kind of like an extra arm in terms of like drafting a board deck or drafting an investor presentation or, or drafting an outreach email. And those aspects of being able to get that first draft would be similar to an assistant doing it. Um, but now it's just allowing IR teams to really kind of like just deliver that much more value to their companies, but it will eliminate all that tactical stuff so again they can focus their time on uh, spending time with their best investors. Christoph Greitman, Investor Relations at Deutsche Telekom, weighs up whether there should be disclosures for using AI in business and the impacts it can have on the IR profession. I agree that there should be disclosure on artificial intelligence generated content but only in those cases where this content is published without the clearance or modification of a human being. 
if a human is clearing or modifying the content, then this content should be attributed to the human being, not the AI. So to assess the impact of AI on investor relations, it's necessary to understand how AI is impacting asset managers and asset management. And it's clear, investors will use AI to get answers to their questions. And then the relevant question for IR is, how can we make sure that these AI systems provide the right and correct answers? I'm sure that AI will transform the day-to-day -day work of investor relations managers fundamentally. If you ignore AI, it's a threat, but if you embrace it, it's a big, big opportunity. Back to the UK. The FCA listing rules reform proposal was launched on the 3rd of May. We ask industry experts what this means for current and upcoming public listed companies. The proposed changes to the listing rules by the FCA aim to boost the attractiveness of the UK listings market. Under the proposals, the regulator would replace existing standard and premium listing segments with a single category. The FCA has also proposed easing the rules around dual class share structures and removing mandatory shareholder votes on transactions such as acquisitions. IA Magazine speaks to Claire Cole, Director of Market Oversight at the FCA, to find out more about the listing proposals. Well, I guess what we were trying to achieve with the proposal was a much clearer um, regime that was easy to understand for both issuers and investors. So what we're proposing to do is take what, what is quite a complicated regime at the moment of premium and standard listings and bring that together into a single listing with a much clearer set of rules. Um, and, and in doing that, we decided to try and move away from the regime that we've had in the past, which is very much focused on shareholder approval to a much more disclosure transparency based regime. So putting a lot more emphasis on um, investors doing their due diligence, looking at the, the investment opportunity in front of them, but allowing the regime to be more flexible to encourage a greater diversity of issuers to the regime. So um, whilst it's um, removing some of the friction in the process, there will still be high standards there. We're in proposing to retain the sponsor regime, which is um, reasonably unique within our jurisdiction as a, a sort of expert advisor. And there will also be some detailed rules and requirements around the disclosure that issuers need to put out. But what we hope is some of that friction from the process at the moment is removed. We also asked Claire about whether Brexit had any impact on the need to reform the listing rules. Uh, on the back of Brexit, the government uh, asked Lord Hill to carry out a review of listing. And actually that became the catalyst for this programme of change. So Lord Hill recommended a number of um, areas that we should look at. Lord Khalif, um, the Khalifa review also uh, added some additional ideas to Lord Hill's review. And taking those, we... Um, had always been keen to look in more detail at the UK listing regime. It's a very old regime. Um, the last time it was fundamentally looked at was in the 80s. So, we were, so the time felt right for change and I think the conditions were there. And what we were hoping to do with the proposals is to really try and drive um, more uh, access, more um, ease, more effective and more effective regime, a better functioning regime with the idea that it would obviously potentially provide greater opportunities, um, greater opportunities for investors, but also greater opportunities for investment in the UK. Noreen Zahid, Director of Invest Relations at venture capital firm Open Ocean, discusses what she thinks the FCA proposals are trying to achieve and the advantages and disadvantages they could pose to companies. I think that they're welcomed. I think that there needs to be some reform for the UK to remain competitive. At the moment, if you are an early stage company or a company which is in growth, the only access of capital that you have is from private markets. Uh, when you think about how portfolios are constructed with the investors, private market allocation is a very small percentage of their total allocation. So by allowing companies to list at an earlier stage and making it a bit more accessible to list, it opens up streams of capital which would otherwise be inaccessible to these companies. So 
it will provide the funding that these companies need. It will provide funding in a more democratized way because it will allow different types of investors to be able to access these companies at different stages. We also asked Noreen about the impact of Brexit and whether it's affected decisions about whether to list in the UK. I don't think necessarily that Brexit has made it worse, but again, if you look at the US market compared to the UK market, yes, it's a deeper market because I think there's more risk tolerance. I think that they're more innovative and in that they are more confident to back riskier asset classes and back riskier companies because I think they see the long-term view of investments in something that's disruptive, whereas the UK has been a bit more traditional. I think Brexit has caused some issues, but I think that the UK is still a strong market and the UK can be a strong market, but we need to remove red tape. So I think we could be as competitive as the US if we carry on making these right moves. That's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.